This is BBC Two. Now, lock the door. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen of the viewing public, I bid you welcome to the Vault of Horror. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Dr. Valpurgis. I am the custodian of the Vault and your modest host for these festivities. As a result of a blood pact signed by Lord Reith in 1929, the British Broadcasting Corporation is tonight obliged to yield sovereignty over the airwaves until tomorrow's dawn, its public service remit suspended for these few hours of darkness. There will be no wholesome family entertainment on this channel for the while, no informative wildlife documentaries, no educational programs, no Tony Slattery. Tonight, we shall contemplate the unthinkable, ponder the unknowable, consider the inconceivable. In the vault, our motion picture selection is choice, offering quaint cannibalism lascivious lycanthropy, axe-ridden alchemy, titillating torture, vigorous vampirism, and venerable vaudeville. And interspersed with these most excellent offerings, we shall be soliciting the opinions of those who have contributed to the sorry state of our vault, those delightful gentlefolk who create and distribute artifacts of agony, horror in all its forms. Cinematic, literary, graphic. The horror film audience wants to be uh taken on a ride, a joy ride. And maybe it's a very cathartic and healing process for them to be brought to, to face their fears and then be able to leave the theater unharmed. They, in a way, have uh, faced the dragon and uh, can live to face a greater dragon in the future. I think we've probably been telling horror stories to each other as long as we've been speaking. Uh, you know, sitting around the fire wondering what all that was up there. <laughs> We are the only critter on this planet that knows we're going to die. And uh, isn't it nice to sort of make up some possibility of what might be out there after that happens? The audience 
the demographic for movies like this is generally young men between the ages of 15 and 25. And I started thinking, those are the young men that usually get sent off to war. Those are the young men that usually get put right in the front line and told to, are told to march into the enemy gunfire. They think they're immortal. That's why they can put them in the uniforms and ship them out to, uh, to fight wars. I think that on certain horror films, when they're, when they're done well, um, are fairy tales, uh, and they, which is to say that on some mythic level, you take one of your darkest fears, and in most horror films, it's, it's the fear of, of uh, untimely death. And I think that all of us, when we are that, that age, have this sort of morbid fear about this, and we can't quite talk about it or get it out, but you can act it out in films. So by taking it out in the open and showing it, it becomes less scary. <laughs> We go to horror movies to see the villain at work. We go to see Dracula, we don't go to see Van Helsing, yeah? Uh, and at the same time as wishing him to be depraved, demanding that he be depraved, uh, being entertained by his depravities, we are at the same time watching in the full and certain knowledge that he will be dispatched. The devil is allowed to play all his best tunes, and we can dance to them for a while, and then know that the pipe will be put down, and that good will come in, and we'll be led out to a clean white dawn. One of the most appealing things about horror films, and why they're so upsetting to adults, um, is because for the audience that they're intended for, that is young people, those, uh, that group of people uh, are looking for the truth. They're just entering adult life. They've been told a lot of distorted things by adults and teachers and authorities, and they're trying to find out what are the, what's the real facts. No, 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 please, no, no, no. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> In that sense, they're dangerous films. The truth is always dangerous, especially to the authority and establishment, and they'll try to censor it. I think if there's any reason that horror has survived and flourished over the decades, it's because violence has escalated during those decades. And horror films provides a sort of a, an escape hatch, which we don't get from real life. Everyone tends to have the same mythological images in their heads. All over the world you have um, vampire stories and you have um, people who don't reflect in mirrors or who cast their images out separately from themselves or who you know, look like they're coming towards you and they're really creeping up behind you and things. But it's amazing how everyone has the same stories. <laughs> There are very few things nowadays um, that can actually give us that thrill anymore um, to set our pulses racing. So they're, they're seeking um, that part of their natures that needs something more. The thrill of the chase, the, um, the feeling of being essentially alive and a good scare makes you feel that way. Other than sex, it's the only thing that really makes you feel that way. G going to a horror film, especially a good horror film, or any thriller or suspense film, Hitchcock or something, it places you in a jeopardy situation without really being in jeopardy. It's very much like a thrill ride, like a roller coaster at an amusement park, where you get on a ride to be frightened, to have that moment when the roller coaster just goes over the edge like that, and you have no control. And for me, the scary part of a roller coaster and a horror movie is not the ride down is not the, the scare, the dip. To me, the horror part is going up the hill to get to it. It's not about how much blood you shed. It's about setting it up. It's about being, it's not really what's behind that door. It's being just afraid of what's behind that door.
because there's all different kinds of suspense. There's a scene where a man, let's, I'm making this up, a man is, puts a gun in someone's mouth. Now, if it's a Russ Meyer movie <laughs> or someone, we know who's telling the joke and we're going, oh gosh, I don't want to see her brains come out her nose. Oh, like that, you know. But if it's a Hitchcock movie, we know who's telling the joke and we're thinking, oh my God, we have all this intellectual information and all this emotional stuff that's going on with this poor character in Jeopardy and oh my God, we don't want her to be killed. And you're getting equal anxiety, but for very different reasons. The scarier movies are the ones, you ever see The Haunting? Not a makeup effect, not a monster, but it scared the shit out of you, didn't it? I mean, and because of how the roller coaster ride going up the hill was presented, you know? What with you, Pondy? It was. I mean, I did. But now it's down near the other end of the hall. The Haunting, Robert Wise's movie, is just what you don't see and what you hear. He played with sound a lot. and. Just cre it was just creepy. In all movies, you've got a creature you don't show people. And um, the haunting never bothers to actually show you the creature, or at least implies that the house itself is the creature. There's a James Whale movie called The Old Dark House, which I find with, a, with a, just a fabulously eccentric and funny performance by Ernest Thesiger and Charles Lawton and Melvin Douglas, and Karloff is frightening in it. As a child, as six years old, The Old Dark House which I saw on TV recently, and it wasn't half as good, naturally, but as a five, six-year-old kid, the effect on me was tremendous. Rosemary's Baby, I think, would be one of my favorites. It's, it's what's gonna happen, those bumps in the night. It's a really scary movie. I think the first horror film that I, I saw that I really, really liked and had a lot of fun with was Night of the Living Dead. It was funny, it was scary, and um, it was different. The first Night of the Living Dead is, is a wonderful film. It was Night of the Living Dead specifically that I had seen as a kid, and it so terrified me, I just admired its ability to, to wrench me into a terrible knot of fear. I love The Exorcist. I think that The Exorcist was a real landmark picture. I, I guess The Exorcist probably affected me the most as a real, you know, under your skin horror film. The Thing, you know, Kristen Nyby and Howard Hawks made this really scary movie. The Thing, the Howard Hawks Thing. The one that I esteem probably above all others is a French film made in 1955, I believe, by Henri Georges Clouseau, Les Diaboliques, and it was a terrifying film done in black and white. To me, the scariest movie was The Tenant by Roman Polanski, because he messed with your head. He was saying, no, what you're seeing isn't what you're seeing, and what you're thinking is wrong. As a teenager, the one that made the most impression was um, Psycho. Beyond doubt, that was the one that changed everything for me. My favorite horror movie of all time is Psycho. I could watch that once a week and find new levels of entertainment in the film. Frankenstein, I mean, I'll never forget as a kid, six years old, being scared to death of that creature. I would go back to James Whale and The Ride of Frankenstein, which I consider to be the greatest horror movie ever made. Here is a movie which manages to be very droll and dark, scary, romantic, ridiculous, spectacular. <laughs> such affection for some of the old ones that I don't think anything's equaled it. I mean, it's sort of like going to church to watch Dracula. It's like looking at a wonderful old house that'll never be built again because you don't have time to, like, deal with each one of those stones. Remember the 1950s. Hula hoops, rock and roll, Doris Day, Canasta, alien commie body snatchers. Ah, happy days and made all the happier by those merry fellows at EC Comics who produced the original Vault of Horror and created quite a stir. The next time, young man, I find you with a worthless piece of shit like this again, you won't sit down for a week, buddy boy. Remember that. <laughs> My memories of EC are, are very fond. 
I mean, those days when I was in the theaters looking at the thing and waiting eagerly for e every issue of, of one of the EC horror mags to come out. I loved those comic books. I just loved them. I love the EC comic books of the 50s, although I've only read the reprints I thought were very funny and uh, really wildly grotesque and unusual for their time period. One that, that really stands out in my mind is uh, some villain, some bad guy, wound up with his head through a carnival uh, wall and someone was throwing hardball baseballs at his head and, and they were very graphic to show the skin flailing off you know and as a child that really it was very gross to me and, and very scary in fact i remember reading those like under my covers in the bed with a flashlight at night and having to being afraid that i would dream about these things you know i came to work uh at ec in the latter part of uh, 48 to 49, somebody recommended me to Bill Gaines. They were doing adventure, science fiction, romance, and uh, he was just starting to dabble, I think, with the, uh, with the horror stuff. But the, the horror books began to move very well for him. William Gaines uh, aided and abetted. He uh, didn't create as much as he gave us the freedom uh, the license or the larceny to commit anything that we wanted to do. There were no rules. Um, we brought in the job and delivered it, and, um, and, and we were like little lapdogs waiting for Bill Gaines to, to uh, giggle. If he giggled and laughed and, and screamed, we knew we had done a successful job. One of the stories I uh, remember especially uh, was a vampire restaurant. And it ended uh, with the only diner uh, and when looking around in this um, restaurant that was walled with mirrors. He could only see himself, and, but it was a crowded restaurant, so he knew he was surrounded. He was um, hoisted upside down and, and uh, tapped like a keg of beer. I think I was the first guy to draw it in comics, a terrific um, uh, throwing up uh, panel, you know, with a guy. He thought he'd eaten uh, tomato soup, and he found out it was warm blood. He was throwing it up. I stood in front of the mirror and got, got that heaving look until I got it right on the paper, you know. They stepped over the line. You know, they were always going that extra inch out to be outrageous or to be a little gorier. It was a Dr. Frederick Wortham, pretty much a quack, and uh, he wrote a book called The Seduction of the Innocents, saying that uh, it was a great cause of juvenile delinquency and uh, got a lot of publicity, and then finally it wound up as a, a senatorial investigation by the United States. The one that got me into the congressional record when they were doing the uh, investigations, that was, uh, <laughs> that was a scenario. That's about a little girl who uh, didn't like her parents. Her father was uh, an alcoholic. The mother was having an affair with another man and she had the preference for living with a, an old maid aunt. She devised a plot where she actually shot the father, took the gun, placed it in her mother's hand so it would have the fingerprints on it while she was uh, unconscious. And so the both of them were uh, electrocuted. And in the last panel, she was um, winking at the reader saying, see, now I got rid of both my parents who I didn't like and I'm living with my aunt that I love. But the big objection to the uh, Senate Committee on Juvenile Delinquency was the fact that uh, the children were seeing this in a, in a bare art technique, going from panel to panel, uh, pretty much uh, explaining it in a way that it was uh, sort of a blueprint for murder, sadism, you name it. I, I always felt it was a, it, it, it was a plot by the conservatives in, in this country because we were dealing with aspects uh, that had some social impact. We were using horror uh, to sometimes give messages. It was just so gritty. It was the first time that it, that it wasn't, you know, sort of neatly put to you. You know, they had foibles, they were ugly, they had, you know, holes in their shoes, things like that. And I just, I just thought, it was, thought it was great. It was real, um, it was the real stuff. They lived in a world that, that we lived in rather than some other world. George Romero and Stephen King wanted to produce films based on the stories that appeared in the EC comics, in the horror comics. 
Steve and Richard Rubenstein and I were sitting around talking about the idea of doing an anthology horror film, which was going to just mix up styles. And Steve said, no, the way to do an anthology, he said, what did we all grow up on is EC. The way to do an anthology is to do a, a comic book. I believe it was George Romero who said, gee, it would be great if we could get one of the old EC guys to set the frame and then have it dissolve into the actual movie. And Stephen King said, yeah, that, I like that idea. Next morning, he showed up with a little outline and he said, it's called Creep Show. And I have these couple of stories that I've already written as short stories and I have, and I'll, within a few, couple of weeks, I'll have ideas for some others and that's how it happened. Next time you see an exploded head spilling brains and cranial fluid into the gutter, just tell yourself, it's only special effects. You see, not everyone is fortunate enough to be born as I was. There aren't any real monsters, unless, of course, you count the backroom bizarros who mix the rubber and gore for the movies. Well, I was 12, 13, I think, and I saw a movie called Man of a Thousand Faces, the story of Lon Chaney, the silent film actor, stuntman, makeup artist. And from that day when I knew what I was going to do, I wanted to be Lon Chaney. I wanted to do makeup. I wanted to be a stuntman. I wanted to be an actor. I wanted to become part of the magic that I had been seeing as a child. <laughs> Tom's just a very energetic, uh, he's one of those guys that's out there giggling with the rest of us, you know, he loves this stuff. My name got famous because of the gore effects, the splatter effects. Um, lots of people were doing them, but uh, if you believe what you read, mine were the most realistic or the most imaginative or the most creative, and I, I think it's because uh, of what I saw in Vietnam as a combat photographer. I mean, I was doing effects way before uh, uh, Vietnam. But, uh, and some people say, uh, think that Vietnam was why I got into the field, which is not true. But uh, being in Vietnam and seeing the real thing, sometimes there was an expression on a cadaver uh, a, uh, or a position of the body. Not a thing, Wilma. Everything's just fine. I used to get a lot of slack on how many women were killed in in the movies that I did. Because I was called sick and demented uh, in lots of articles, and I have to remind these people, you know, I don't write this stuff. My job is to take the script and make what's in it as realistic as possible. I've done so many effects films for some directors who don't know how to shoot effects. They don't understand that it's magic tricks. You have to show something in the scene before the effect happens to make the effect val valuable. Like a, you show a real axe smashing through a wall to give the axe some validity, some, some lethal, uh, some strength before you have the rubber axe hit somebody. Because then the rubber axe is scary, you know? Well, George Romero, uh, I've done, I think, eight films for George. We've, we've done them all in Pittsburgh except for a two-week stint during Day of the Dead where we went to Florida to film the beach scenes. We don't have any beaches here in Pittsburgh. The effects in that, I, I won the Saturn Award for that film. The effects to me were, were really illusions, were really magic tricks. If you've ever seen that, the guy lying, the head that was just a brain sticking in there, it was a real actor I was on, you know, and his head was bent way back on the table. Even Dick Smith said, how did you do that? And I told him it was a real person, he couldn't believe it. He couldn't believe that you could bend a head back that far. He's much more creative than he is technical. He'll look for uh, a way to solve things with, you know, what he's got here at hand rather than start thinking about morphing or, you know, electronics. Working with George is, uh, is, is wonderful because he does the same thing with effects that he does with actors. He'll allow them to improvise and say it their own way. Effects, the same thing. He'll let us, uh, we'll sit around and we'll invent ways to kill people like on uh, Dawn of the Dead. And we'll go to George and say, how about if we take a, a, a screwdriver and drive it in some zombie's ear? And he'll go, okay. <laughs> Creepshow was uh, one of the best films I've done uh, for George. Lots of juicy effects. It was just me and an assistant uh, that uh, created all that stuff in very little time. So I'm very proud of that. In fact, every time we cast somebody's head, we always say, 
that the best subject we ever had was E.G. Marshall. And he was very old at the time and free, and we thought he would be claustrophobic and complain, you know. I've had people whimper under the life cast. And we made a head cast of him, and um, we built it in rubber, as you see, with a fiberglass backing. It's hollow. And um, we had these large syringes that were filled with, by the entomologists with cockroaches. And um, <clears throat> from beneath the set, they would just pull, press the plunger of the, uh, of the syringe, and it would force cockroaches to come up. And his chest was uh, toilet paper. We made it up to look like his skin. And of course, when the roaches were getting toward it, uh, uh, they were forced through the toilet paper. And we at the same time pumped blood on the roaches. So when they came out, they would recover with blood and they would leave little roach footprints all over E.G. Marshall. I was never in the same room with the cockroach. We had 28,000 roaches. I was always outside the sealed room looking through a piece of glass. Okay, cue the blood, cue the roaches, and I was never in the same room with those roaches. One time one accidentally touched me on my hand and I appeared. I don't remember running, but I, I felt like I appeared on the other side of the room. You know? I have this urge every now and then that I have to scare somebody. It's like, a, it's like an addiction. I'm not, I'm not an addict, I don't take drugs, but I need that shot in the arm every now and then of scaring somebody real bad. So I'll be lying in bed and she'll go down to, or my girlfriend or my daughter would go down and get something to drink. And while she's gone, the urge will come. So I'll go and I'll get this fake head of myself and stick it in the bed and build up the pillows around me and pull the covers up like I'm still lying there watching television. And I go hide in the closet, so I'll wait until they come back, and now as far as they're concerned, I'm still in the bed. So I wait for them to sit down back in the bed and start eating or drinking what they went down for, and I'll loom out of the closet from the ground up, like that, and I, my daughter would, her, the food would fly up in there and she'll scream and fly backwards, and I got the exact same response, it's incredible, from my girlfriend. They fly backwards and scream in this helpless uh, moral reflex, you know the moral reflex where the hands come up? Same thing, now I, this may sound very strange and I may seem like a sadist, but it's <laughs> the reward of that scare is incredible. A hulking and deeply ungracious retard in a hockey mask, a deep-fried child murderer with terrible clothes sense, a leather-clad baldy with nails stuck in his bonds. Just how far are people prepared to go to get a horror franchise started? And what does it take to be a real monster these days? The movie was made with a, a marvelous producer, Christopher Figg, who had not produced a movie, but then I hadn't directed one, so we were sort of, we were uh, bonded by our ignorance. We want the man who did this. We shot it in Dollis Hill, uh, and uh, I was at that point blessed with um, an actor in uh, Doug Bradley to embody Pinhead the villain of the piece, who only appears for a very short time in the first picture, who married up with the makeup design so well and impressed audiences so profoundly that the movie became, without any of us planning it, a sort of vehicle for this otherworldly entity. We have such sights to show you. Well, Nightmare on Elm Street had a, a, a a sort of a unique beginning uh, in my body of work. It actually came out of a series of newspaper articles, uh, very, very small articles, uh, about um, young men in their 20s who had had severe nightmares, had um, been afraid to sleep after that, and when they did sleep the next time, they died. And I just said, wow, this is an incredible story. Here's a person that perceives a truth that is so unique uh, and so threatening to everybody because nobody wants to admit that we can be attacked in our dreams. <laughs> it then became just a matter of figuring out who is the killer in the dream and, uh, and what are his motivations. And uh, then I began to piece together this idea of Freddy Krueger's character who was uh, a completely despicable and heinous person, but who had been killed in a completely illegal and immoral way himself. <laughs> yes, sir. The souls of the 
children. Give me strength. I was flat broke. Uh, Friday the 13th was meant and expected to be a pot boiler. Uh, I thought that the two children's films I was doing on were going to be the very successful films. And finally, I, uh, well, I was trying to think of a different title for one of the children's films. I came up with the title Friday the 13th. I said, Friday the 13th. If I had a picture called Friday the 13th, I could sell that. What I wound up doing is on the 4th of July, I took out this full page ad in Variety and said, from the producer of Last House on the Left comes the most terrifying film ever made, Friday the 13th. <laughs> we didn't have anything. All we had was this title treatment. And uh, we were sitting around a kitchen table, Victor Miller and I, um, saying things like, hmm, well, what do you think scary? How are we gonna, how are we gonna make this, this movie actually work? Because we don't have a lot of money and, and so on. And we just sort of invented it as we went along. Um, but I, I got a phone call from a guy named Sean Cunningham. Um, about doing this movie called Friday the 13th. He sent me the script, I broke it down. I went to visit him in uh, uh, Connecticut and there, was not, there wasn't an ending to the film in the, in the script. They had, uh, uh, they were gonna do something, they didn't know quite what yet. And uh, so I invented the ending uh, for, the, for, the, for the Jason character. If that's why you see Jason in the film, he pops up at the end, you know. And of course, uh, I, was, I turned down part two because Jason, uh, was alive in the story, and I'm thinking, well, he, he was never alive. It was the mother who was the killer. This is all we're going to change that. But I turned it on anyway and did the burning, and of course the movie came out, and there was Jason, and there's been Jason ever since. One of the curses of, of what we'll call franchise movies, movies that, you know, will, will spin off a series, is that there is less to explore than the filmmakers would ideally like so that by the time you get to episode five of Friday the 13th series, there really isn't anything left to say. This is a mute character who goes around with a machete killing teenagers. Yes, they are franchise movies. I mean, you know, Jason's become like a merchandising phenomenon, just like Freddy Krueger, just like Pinhead. Um, so what? I mean, I go in expecting a certain formula. I expect to hear the kill, kill, kills on the soundtrack. I want to see sort of Jason revived in another ludicrous way. Freddie's commercial success and sort of personal um, success was a big surprise to me. I never would have guessed that. Uh, I knew I was constructing a character that was powerful and very frightening, but um, I never guessed that it would be embraced by children, for instance. I get fan letters from six-year-olds saying, we love Freddy, you know. Great graphics. I always think that kids left on their own are, are you know, the best that we have, and they're uncorrupted. So that uh, what, whatever they're doing with Freddy, it doesn't mean they're going to go out and claw their little sister to death. It probably means that uh, there are certain things about Freddy that are positive to them. One thing, Freddy uh, always tells the truth. Dr. Seuss. Freddy's becoming a good guy. I, I saw one of, one of them in the States, and the audience, when he comes out, they're cheering. He's on a skateboard, yeah, good old Freddy. And you think, well, hang on a minute, this bloke's supposed to be the villain. But I suppose, it, I suppose it's because the teenager's so obnoxious. You, you, your sympathy is with, is with the killer. No screaming while the bus is in motion. All these other monsters were around, and Pinhead sort of broke the mold. He wasn't a one-line uh, joke meister like Freddy. He wasn't, as I say, mute like the stalk and slash villains. He mingled the fascinating and the repulsive. And out of that ambiguity came an enthusiasm on behalf of the audience, which uh, still startles me. And so with Hellraiser 3, uh, we've constructed a narrative which takes Pinhead out onto the streets of New York. The main thing to say about it, I think, is that it's a, is that it's Pinhead story. It's a movie which, which, um, uh, which tells his tale. Come on, come on! How dare you! Thou shalt not bow down before any graven image.
One of the primal myths of the horror movie is the werewolf legend explored in our next treat by Hammer Films. The Curse of the Werewolf, made in 1960, is being shown tonight in an extended version, never before seen in public, with long deleted slobber and slash sequences, lovingly restored. By now, you will have realized that people who make horror films are a down-to-earth, family-loving bunch with absolutely no neuroses or perversions whatsoever. At least, that's what they all try to convince you. But there are those who practice a solitary vice, who drool over a word processor in private to produce the vilest of volumes. I never in my life set out to write a horror story, so I'm okay. I just get ideas, and if they interest me, I sit down and I, I write them. I had a good job in advertising, but somehow um, it wasn't enough for me. I was on the art side. I was an art director. And one day I just decided to, to do a book. It was literally just how it came out. I had no... I, I mean, I wanted to break down barriers. I mean, I'd been used to the... Dennis Wheatley type of horror for, you know, uh, when I was a kid. I wanted to do something a bit more. I wanted to show the real horror of horror. I think of myself as, as, a, as a fabulist, as somebody who writes dark fantasy, horror, science fiction, that whole body of, of imaginative fiction. My influences have always been cinematic rather than literary. And I know a lot of, certainly of the older authors, their, their influences have been people like Edgar Allan Poe, and H.P. Lovecraft, who tended to leave more to the reader's imaginations. My main influence on, well, really on my books and certainly on my life has been Sam Peckinpah. I was corresponding, as a 15-year-old boy, with H.P. Lovecraft. He was a man who hinted at something that later became an important part of my own approach to writing. That is that there's something behind ordinary appearances the world as we perceive it. It was a sort of a paranoid perception of the universe, which I found very helpful. Well, Poe's okay. I mean, I have a couple of tapes of Poe stories, and I can listen to him. I find Poe unlistenable. I mean, I find Lovecraft unreadable and unlistenable at this point. The great works by Poe uh, remain as dark and as profoundly disturbing as I think they were when they were first written. I like story values that reach for you and grab you and say, come here. I think the explicit horror, um, the very graphic horror, took off really because it hadn't been done before. And because it was fresh, and because it was knocking down barriers in the horror field, because it was letting people know really how it felt to be horrified, to be, dare I say, to be mutilated. Um, they seem to like it. Many of the people that are writing uh, horror today, or yeah, are trying to write horror, are also trying to imitate what they have seen on film. And they're trying to put into verbal terms the visual images that they relate to. There's an element of uh, sadism in there which I frankly don't approve of particularly. You have to just make sure that everybody knows that you know what you're talking about, rather than just saying, oh, the bullet hit him in the lung and exploded from his back. Couple with the fact I do quite enjoy writing these uh, disgustingly descriptive passages. You, you actually hone your imagination. It's like uh, uh, souping up a car or something, and after a while, the idea of something that's too frightening to contemplate almost doesn't exist anymore. I hate anything to do with kids that um mutilates them, harms them, causes them psychological terror. And I've always tried to avoid that. I mean, um, the first book I did, I, I, I had a baby being torn to pieces by monster rats. And I've always regretted that. I wish I hadn't done it. We have 
strange niches and recesses which of course can lead us into uh, painful and perhaps uh, uh, dangerous situations but they are also the places where our creativity is rooted. If you read a horror novel, you, like I say, you're, ex you're expected or people expect to have the shit scared out of them, expect to be moved in some way, whether it's to the toilet or the psychiatrist. You need to make them feel an extreme reaction, and the only way to make them feel an extreme reaction is by writing in an extreme way. Violence, cruelty, sadistic activity is not the major attraction, or need not be the major attraction. I think the basis of all true horror is rooted in fear, fear of the unknown. I mean, I have a close relationship with the reader because it's, it's my cell. Um, I write the kind of books that I like. I write for myself. I'm telling myself stories. I'm passing the time. If I don't write over the course of a week, I get cranky and I don't sleep well because I miss my stories. All you can do is basically write what you want to write and just pray across that somebody wants to read it. The, the fact is, my sort of stuff is perfect for kids because they hand it around in the playground and they're all like really well-thumbed copies. Whoa, look at that bit on page 25 where his head comes off. We, uh, in Stephen King's words, rehearse death. Uh, and I think we also allow for a moment uh, the darkness in ourselves to have some um, time out in the world. The general horror fan wants entertainment. That's why they read the books and see the movies. So I, I don't think you can kid yourself as a writer or filmmaker that you're doing any more than that. I got a letter from a lady once who uh, read Salem's Lot and said it frightened her and, and it disgusted her and repulsed her and she was so angry and that when she finished the book she doused it with gasoline and lit it on fire and I thought, marvelous. This book has had a visual measurable effect on this old bitch. And I just loved it. I thought it was great. Besides, I got the royalty on that book. And next on The Vault of Horror. He was the first superhero from New Jersey. He came to Tromaville and single-handedly wiped out crime, corruption, and chemical waste. The name's Avenger. That toxic Avenger. You've seen the Brontosaurus, the Tyrannosaurus, but you won't believe your eyes when you come face to face with the Tromosaurus. Ooh, it feels so good. It's almost like you've got a mouth down there. Troma is from the ancient Latin. The name means uh, excellence on celluloid. So Michael Herz and I began this studio to create uh, entertaining and traumatic movies. Uh, in the history of cinema, Troma is the only studio that has existed for 20 years and has never ever had a hit. areas just filled with people who practice black magic in one fashion or the other. It's the toys. Someone's inside the toys. Playtime! See what happens when people are bad. Oh. Are we having fun yet? It's not real! I really try to do pictures that I would enjoy watching and you know the truth is there are only a few big a event movies in the course of a calendar year and people who have an appetite for this kind of fair um, would like to watch them more frequently so we've been lucky enough to be consistently on the video shelves you know in between the Terminator 2's and the Alien 3's and the other big blockbusters we've had our trancers and Puppet Master and Doll Man and Demonic Toys. I've seen them walk react to sound as if they could hear it's as if they were alive Well, the Troma building is located in the heart of one of the finest neighborhoods in New York, uh, the very beautiful and exclusive Hell's Kitchen. And um, the people who are uh, gathered about our neighborhood, the people who live in this neighborhood, are uh, quite a bit more horrifying than anything your vault of horror is going to show. 
we got the Toxic Avenger idea out of the stories in 19, early 1980s about toxic waste dumps all over the world, ticking away like time bombs ready to uh, explode onto our um, culture and bring us all down in a morass of mutants. And 10 years later, it turns out that the Toxic Avenger is politically correct. They taunted him. They tormented him until he had a horrifying accident and fell into a vat of nuclear waste. Transforming little Melvin into a hideously deformed creature of superhuman size and strength. Melvin became the Toxic Avenger. I think the biggest influence, other than some books which I read and enjoyed, uh, were the early Marvel comics. And I liken what I'm doing here very much to making the comic books of the 90s. I feel that almost everything Full Moon is doing, not so much by design, but just the way it seems to be coming together, uh, is what Marvel Comics did in the 60s. You know, we're creating characters and themes and plots, and if they work well, they go to series. We're now beginning to team these characters up with each other. So we just finished a movie right now, which is Doll Man versus the Demonic Toys. The other thing that makes the Troma movies interesting is that if you look at all of our posters and all of the beginnings of our movies, it always says the Troma team. So that even though Michael Herz and I call ourselves the directors, usually everybody on the set is directing. If a man is delivering the lunch, he will be asked to direct uh, or come up with jokes or, or what have you. And as a result, there's a tremendous energy to the Troma movies. I think what happens in Hollywood is, you know, and this goes for all over the world, is you make these pictures pretty much in a vacuum and then they somehow magically wind up through the distribution pipeline in a video cassette on a video store owner's shelf. And that's fine, but after a while, after years of that, you kind of forget what this thing's all about and it is, it is show business. So I just felt it was time to, uh, to really go around the country and talk to these people and, and let them know what we're about to do in the future. The basic problem is the double standard. Uh, the conspiracy of the, um, of the labor, uh, corporate, and bureaucratic elite to destroy any independent thought or any independent uh, entrepreneurial uh, effort. Uh, that is the problem. So the censor boards all around the world uh, and the MPAA in America, in our opinion, have double standards. If you, if you are Paramount or if you are Rank or if you are uh, Time Warner or if you are uh, MCA Universal, you will go to them and they'll have one set of standards. And if you're Troma, they will disembowel your movie. <laughs> It's tough. You look at a lot of these movies. I, I'm not talking about the major films. I'm talking about just a lot of the independent product, and some of it is really tough to watch. I mean, in fairness, they shouldn't be just B movies. They should be the whole alphabet, you know, and we've all seen Z movies, so uh, I'm not sure where we fit, but I, hopefully we're close to the A. As time has gone on, we've become an institution. We're a national treasure. And I think due to our, our work in uh, uh, World Peace Through Celluloid, uh, it will not be long before a trauma is awarded the uh, coveted uh, Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> I hear a lot of my colleagues uh, talk about um, some, you know, social redeeming value these movies have and people don't go out to the streets and beat other people up or do horrific things because they get out their frustrations, they look at horror films and I don't believe in any of it. I think it's, it's 90 minutes of entertainment. Many come to the vault and ask what frightens me. Always I reply that the only people who really terrify me are Americans. What could be more American than that deep-seated impulse to spew forth merchandising upon the world, to wrap up the sacred cause of horror in the gaudy pages of a rag with an absurd name? But, as a public service, the vault takes you behind the scenes at Fangoria magazine. Christ. <laughs> Fangoria was conceived as an offshoot of uh, Starlog magazine in 1979. In the beginning, we used to cover Doctor Who and more fantasy-related stuff until we put a, an exploding head from Dawn of the Dead in the magazine, and all of a sudden the readers said, let's see the gore, let's see the blood. Fangoria 
is mainly goes to the male audience ages 15 to about 22 who are interested in special effects. They don't go see Steven Spielberg movies. The Fangoria readers into, you know, real hard-hitting horror and um, stuff that's outside of the mainstream. A lot of um, the makeup people who are now in Hollywood started reading Fangoria 14, 15 years ago. I owe a lot to Fangoria magazine. I think that they, are, they had a lot to do with making me famous. Uh, for one thing, I, I always, for a while, uh, every magazine that came out, uh, my name or my photo was in there somewhere. It's important that kids understand that this is make-believe. We tend to uh, stay away from real-life serial killers and mass murder and things like that because we want to talk about the fun of film. We tend to go for the films that seem uh, more respectable and have more quality to them than you know, a lot of the run-of-the-mill stuff. Considering the audience that we reach, I mean, we do go, I mean, there are people who pick up the magazine who are older than 22, be 40, 45, and some 12-year-olds or 10-year-olds. And we strongly believe that it's not our place to promote nudity in the magazine, serial killers in the magazine as some of the uh, trading cards are coming out. Anything that can be real, we will not promote. We don't want to be put with the, the smut magazines, and so we have to keep, you know, pictures of uh, naked bodies out of the magazine. We could show naked monsters, but we can't say, show naked women, which is okay with me, because, you know, I, f I find that stuff a little on the sleazy side anyway. The blood and guts, at least the readers know it's make-believe. Well, that's part of the, you know, American tradition, I would think. In Sweden, for instance, uh, I know they have very heavy censorship against violence. And yet, you can show sex with animals, you can show any child pornography is legal there. I mean, it, it, every society is different. We do have licensed publications of Fangoria in Spain. We do specials. Sometimes the specials are sold in Germany or in France or in Italy. Sweden, who is very much an anti-violent country, does very well in selling Fangoria publications and Gore Zone. I'm not too happy with the present Fangoria gore zone. They, they tend to dwell on gore, I think, too much. I mean, uh, when it's a still photograph, you know, in color, it's sort of like, I want my kids looking at this. I mean, it, it gets a little weird, actually. And what's, what's interesting about Fangoria, the level of writing in Fangoria is really quite good. And the reportage is really good, but the illustrations are really tacky most of the time. Fangoria's had a lot of critics over the years. Um, the fundamentalist groups have come down hard on us. We've been banned in Canada, and we had problems in Britain when uh, an MP brought uh, the magazine to Margaret Thatcher's attention, and she said something to the effect that this is a magazine that children shouldn't see. We've had some censorship problems there, but the, the magazine's still carried in most, most of your shops, including uh, Forbidden Planet. We sell a variety of magazines devoted really to horror special effects. There's a whole subgenre of magazines there, Fangoria being the most well known, bought by almost exclusively males and I'd suspect males that want to get into the industry. There's an enormous <laughs> frustrated crowd of um, special effects fiends out there just waiting for their break. The Fangoria market has, has grown considerably in recent years and in 1990 we produced uh, three Fangoria feature films which are now uh, uh, starting to come out on uh, videotape in the, the United States after playing various festivals and premiering at the London Film Festival. <laughs> We started the convention circuit in uh, 1985 where we would throw a big horror party over a weekend and thousands of fans would show up to meet their favorite horror celebrities. We have uh, Fangoria uh, trivia contests, we have autograph sessions with the guests, a giant marketplace of monster memorabilia. And you have kids who are 10 years old, 12 years old, or my little nephew who's 7 years old had his uh, makeup done with an eye coming out, and he was hysterical laughing. It's just a, a real celebration of horror, the Fangori conventions. We show movies, we have talks with the celebrities. It's, it's a great place to see the magazine come alive in three dimensions.
Personally, I deplore these scuttling modern creatures, these Freddies and Jasons with them. Prosthetics and machetes, these pinheads and leather faces with their Christmas cracker jokes and Roman numerals. Arrgh. You see, in the great days of the cinema, they had real monsters like Dracula, the mummy, the Frankenstein monster. They had real actors to play them, like the sainted William Henry Pratt better known as Boris Karloff, billed here simply as Karloff in perhaps the greatest sequel ever made. It's very late now. Those busybodies from the National Viewers and Listeners Association have long ago given up waiting for any blasphemous bestiality. They've gone to bed with their Coco and Geoffrey Archer. So now we can tackle the thorny question of horror and My overall view on, on sex and horror is that they share the same arena, which is the body. There is also, I think, a sense that um, when we are um, confronting the horrific, we are in a heightened state of some kind or other. When the adrenaline is rushing through our systems, we are aware of the world in a different kind of way. The same is true in a state of sexual arousal. It does satisfy a primal urge. I think it's the idea of um, drifting in through somebody's window in the cloak and being able to bite someone in the neck and put someone into trance definitely does um, appeal to a certain um, urgent people, the same as um, sprouting fur and fangs at full moon and you know, going out for a, for a run across the rooftops and things is something which um, a lot of people would probably like to do. The girl uh, melts in Dracula's arms, Dracula applies his teeth to her neck, she sighs and it is both a death rattle and uh, an orgasm. Uh, in, in the case of the Hellraiser movies, uh, we pushed that whole plain, pain pleasure thing a little bit further. And interestingly, uh, where we had the most problems with the, the, the classifiers or the sensors was where we, we were perceived to be crossing uh, a boundary. Ladies first. One of the things that uh, is violently attacked in, um, in horror films uh, and um, genre films in general is any suggestion of mixing of sex and violence. Uh, now again, of course, we can find no examples in real life of mixtures of sex and violence. <laughs> I mean, ICBMs don't look like anything sexual, do they? But, um, you know, anyway, you're not allowed to sort of talk about that or imply that those things get mixed together all the time in, in, in human conduct. In series like the Friday the 13th series, and I don't mean to single that one out, but if you have sex, you will die. Uh, you could pretty much count on, if there are two characters that get introduced that you've not seen before, and if they take off their clothes, within about five minutes, Jason's probably going to put a knife into them. And so there are weird undercurrents of morality. It's usually the virgin the woman who is virtuous and true that lives. I think women, they get a really raw deal, mostly because the movies are as a general rule, written and conceived by, um, by men, and all they can think of to do is kill the women. All they can think of to do is, you know, chop their breasts off or, or you know, sexually abuse them and then kill them. It indicated qu 
quite clearly the, the worst of the culture's attitude towards women. That is, they, uh, they were used sexually, um, they were raped, they were uh, made to be naked, they were humiliated, uh, they were chased. They usually were quite helpless. They were usually rescued by a man. Quite often they fainted, they screamed, they were inept. I mean, it was everything you would, you know, if you put yourself into uh, um, a woman's psyche and body, uh, you would say, how dare they, you know, imply all this crap about me. So um, I just took all of those images of uh, sort of the 50s horror uh, ingenue as the, the inept weakling and, and, and turned it around and made it into Nancy, who was the one who saw the truth, who refused to believe the lies, who um, did battle with Freddie, and if she didn't have the right weapons, then she found out where she could find the right weapons. It was fun to do that, you know, for, uh, for the girls in the audience, for the women in the audience. I think women, because they give birth, are, are much more, um, find life much more precious at an earlier age. Um, so I think that's probably why a lot of women, you know, maybe aren't immediately attracted to this genre because so much of it is about killing people. <laughs> oh my God! We're looking at death, violent death, the breaking of body surfaces, obsession, madness, perversity, depravity, atrocity. And we're finding narrative forms in which we can address these issues and uh, maybe strengthen our, our personal defenses against them if we ever have to deal with them in the, in the real world. And so to Italy, land of architecture and pasta, gondolas and Catholicism, the mafia and eyeball-gouging zombies. Let us hie to Minneapolis for an introduction to Italy's premier horror meister, Dario Argento. Dario Argento is, I think, uh, the, the Gauguin of filmmakers. He's an expressionist. He has a tremendous understanding of the visual power, of, uh, and he can tell a story purely visually. Uh, and, and in that sense, his stuff is always exciting and wonderful to look at. <sighs> Dario Argento will always be my favorite horror film director. Um, I shall never forget seeing The Bird with the Crystal Plumage for the first time. It was such a different sort of movie. It was so shocking for that particular time um, that I slavishly followed his career from that moment on. <laughs> How do I open the door? <laughs> I always see it as like he does, he takes life and betrays it with his imagination. And, you know, people accuse him of having it's all style over content. And I say, well, but what fantastic style and what fabulous content. Open the door. Open the door. When you have a style exactly and uh, clear, you're, you're, you're recognizable, like a painter, no? 30 seconds, you say, this is De Palma, this is uh, Craven, this is Argento. Uh, trauma is a throwback for Dario in many respects. It echoes his early films, The Bird with the Crystal Plumage and Deep Red. It's a murder mystery where you really have to pay attention to what you're seeing on the screen because you're going to see something in the film that isn't quite true. Just leave me alone. They're dead, you know that? Yeah, so people die. It happens every day. They were decapitated. What? I said 
that they were decapitated. In Bird with the Crystal Plumage, it was Tony Musanti thinking he saw a murder in a different way than it actually was perceived by the audience. And this one, I think, is the cleverest he's ever come up with. I really do believe that. It's going to fool a lot of people. We have so many questions. We who are gathered here. Oh, well, Dario is, is priceless. <laughs> Dario is, uh, to me, Dario is an eccentric uh, uh, visual stylist uh, genius, as far as I'm concerned. Um, he's one of the guys that can take a limitation and turn something extraordinary out of it. You did 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 it. way of working is absolutely incredible. I mean, you can read the script all you like. It won't bear any relation to the finished film as such. Also, I mean, he sort of makes things up as, as he goes along. I mean, the Steadicam operator on Trauma is a guy called Kurt Gardner, and he said he was supposed to be doing about 10% of the film, and he ended up doing about 25% in the first two weeks, and it was all very low-level stuff. This is all going to be sort of like a very on-the-ground movie, sort of looking up. He has it planned to a certain degree, but when he's actually on the set and realises the potential of it, and the way he sort of can move the sort of like the props around, then it sort of suggests more things to him. And therefore he gets even more inventive as a result. <laughs> Every moment, every lots of moment in my pictures because uh, the camera is my, like my mind uh, or um, like my eyes. And uh, sometimes camera don't follow the, also the actor. Sometimes the camera goes and describes all the things, all the sensations, uh, all the impressions. He, he goes a lot for subjective shots. He puts you in the murderer's position. He's always said that unless you can sort of respond psychologically, you won't really understand the sort of the motives of the murderer. He does what every director would love to do and sometimes does. And then he'll, he'll as his head hits the pillow at night, something will fly through his mind, some creative visual vision, and uh, he'll create it. He'll actually take it and step by step put it on the film. <laughs> Visually, this is very, uh, going to be a very dark film. It's all very dark and interior, and the house and all the interior sort of are representing the body of the murderer. This whole sounds very pretentious, but the way he says it actually makes a lot of sense. Sometimes uh, the purpose is to look inside you, to open your breast and look inside your soul, how the color, or what's uh, inside you. We all, your dark side. Violence is Italian art. I mean, that's exactly what Dario said to me once, and I, I firmly believe that. I mean, uh, he's often accused of, of showing sort of like very pretty girls being murdered, but I mean, this goes back to the Gothic romance tradition of the damsel in distress, and I think that... And he's very informed by the H.P. Lovecraft and the Edgar Allan Poe school. Edgar Allan Poe was also the first one of the first writers uh, really impressed me and it changed my life because uh, it teach me to look inside me, to discover my, my monster, our monster, not just mine, but every people have a monster inside. I mean, he can just sort of take a camera, point it at something, and out of nowhere he can conjure up this, you know, amazing world out of thin air almost, and I think he's about the only person who can actually do that. All cities are built upon cemeteries. London, more so than most, is erected upon the bones of the toilers who shed their blood for the buildings and byways. Our next film delves into the heart of our beloved capital and explores its most unsettling transport system, the London Underground.